and welcome to the Bazura Project and our guide to cinema. That's cinema with an S. Because research shows that 9 out of 10 television programs with misspelled titles have a 78% chance to use fake statistics. And tonight's show is the most fakely statistical of all. It's all about fame. Yes, from silenced silent actors and constricting contracts to shooting presidents for child stars and accidentally on purpose leaked sex tapes, we'll dig up all the dirt on fame in film and provide you with so much useless information you'd think we were working for News Corp. But fame in film is an incredibly broad topic. We should be applauded for even attempting it. So let's begin our fame forensics by tapping the phones of history. But first, isn't this the best crowd you've ever seen? Piss off, you bunch of ingrates. Get out! Fame seems synonymous with the film industry, but fame as we know it used to be fame as other people knew it. Before movies, celebrities were people like Marie Curie, Thomas Edison, Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Clearly, that was a value system way out of whack. And so, in the early 1900s, Hollywood was invented to restore balance to the force. As the growing popularity of the burgeoning film industry increased, the actors' names were never credited for fear they'd form a union, make unrealistic demands for giant trailers and score $20 million for six weeks' work. But that was never going to happen. <laughs> One studio, the Biograph Studio, regularly used an actress by the 100% real name of Florence Lawrence. She made 65 Biograph films in 1909 and fans started writing into the studio wanting to know more about the nameless Biograph girl. A rival studio poached Lawrence in 1910 and wanted her to make a grand entrance, so a rumour was started that Lawrence had died in a traffic accident. A few days later, the studio announced that she was alive and well and now working for them. Suddenly, Florence Lawrence was front page news, and in one single motion, Hollywood had invented stars, spin, gossip, fake deaths, comebacks, and a complete lack of moral fortitude that remains uncorrupted to this day. With actors now the new currency, studios devised a plan to keep them under lock and key. But in addition to the studios controlling the careers of their actors, they also managed all the public information about them as well. A reporter found out that I'm gay. You remember my secretary this afternoon? You'll have your first kid next week. I'm an alcoholic. We'll stick you in a film about addiction and claim you're a method actor. I slept with an underage girl. We'll ship you to France and give you an Oscar. An entire industry of star culture suddenly sprung up around movie stars. Motion Picture Story magazine, the first film fan magazine, was created in 1911 with all the hottest Hollywood news. The stars started paying attention to how much attention they were being paid. They now had the power and they demanded much more control over their careers. What roles they could play, who they could work for and for how much. And so, every decade, a new crop of pretty young things captures the public's imagination and finds itself in every second film. Marlon Brando, Paul Newman, Jack Nicholson, Zero. Harrison Ford, Tom Cruise, Matt Damon. And let's set. not forget the women either, who dress them and make their coffee. Today, there are hundreds of TV shows, websites and magazines dedicated to following famous actors' every move. What they're wearing, who they're dating, where they're living, how they're adopting. But if history has taught us anything, it's that fame is fleeting. The only real measure of a person's worth is their talent and integrity. Oh, crap. Ingrates! Ingrates, come back! I've got so much more going on above the surface! Ingrates! It all began when I was a child. My father wanted me to go into the family business, but I had bigger dreams. But, Abba, I don't want to be a popular entertainer. I'd rather be a cantor here in our synagogue. It is a tradition amongst our people to turn our back on our religion and go out and control the media. Now, take this ham sandwich and go put on your blackface. My career truly started when a talent scout spotted me at a beauty pageant. You there! Yeah, you! Ever done any acting? Well, I am a compulsive liar. That's perfect. Come to this address tomorrow morning. 
Sir? I'm not really a compulsive liar. I lied. Kid, I have a feeling you're gonna go far. And then came the movies. Technicolor fantasies. Maybe your courage was inside you the whole time. Dickensian dramas. Maybe your tolerance for racial minorities was inside you the whole time. Hardcore science fiction films. Maybe the alien was inside you the whole time. Ah! During that time I saw or had it all. Sex, violence, money, profanity, drugs, everything we've discussed over the past five episodes. It was a time of hedonism and excess. And I thought it would never end. Kid, we've decided to go in a different direction. But this precocious five-year-old who tap dances with an aging black man is the part I was born to play. Maybe so, but we've cast an actual five-year-old girl. I'm sorry, kid. Well, what do I do now? There's plenty of work out there for a creepy 30-year-old man pretending to be a prepubescent girl. Really? No, I'm lying. You're finished. It was all over. I went from being the toast of the town to a washout before I even knew what hit me. It's been a really, really long week. Doctor, I need to know. Am I crazy? Doctor? Without a certificate of authenticity, that's worth nothing. A. Joel Lee writes, you have no idea what it's like to be famous. There's no privacy. Your every move is scrutinized and broadcast all over the world. Every waking moment is lived through a veil of constant voyeurism. I hate myself and everyone on the planet. This letter we found in her garbage is right. Being a movie star isn't like working in a coal mine or cleaning a coal toilet. It's actually hard. So put down that script, lock the door of your trailer, and put your agent on hold as we present the Bazura Project's guide to being a movie star. So, what is a movie star? A movie star is somebody very attractive whose name fits on the top of a poster. The ability to act is sometimes an advantage, but without those first two elements, your dream is over now. But fear not. There are ways to remedy just how visually and linguistically ugly you are. You want to create a mythology around yourself, either heightening or eliminating any truth from your past so it sounds impossibly endearing to the very general public. So, tell me your story. Well, I grew up in the suburbs. You grew up on the mean streets. I watched a lot of television. You dreamt of being on the silver screen. I slept on the streets for three months. You slept on the streets for six months. Until you hit me with your car. Until fate struck. And now I'm here. I think we can make this work. Your first film has to be a very small and exploitative role in an embarrassing genre picture. Curse it! The command ship Delta has been destroyed. Captain Astroman has interfered for the last time. Slave, bring his companions to me. I have a surprise in store for the captain, and this time, there will be no escape. <laughs> You'll continue your career slowly but steadily, getting ever larger roles in ever larger films. You're going to have to send the entire army in here to stop me! Excuse me, Doctor. Here's your coffee. Yeah, thanks. Ah, los niños están muy loco! Ay, ay, ay! And then you'll find it the one breakthrough role you need to catapult you into stardom. The pinnacle of fame is when you make a film about being famous. Whack on some aging makeup and remember when you were a superstar, charming audiences worldwide. Throw in some big romantic moments and some Oscar-baiting heartbreak and the formula is complete. Now you're a movie star, your career choices will change dramatically. Every film offer will come your way, regardless of your suitability. Great news. They want you to play Rosa Parks in her life story. How am I supposed to do that? All right. Um, what about this remake of Speed? Movie stars never communicate with normal people, so the only way they can pretend to care about third world issues is through interviews. 
While the celebrity interview is a delicate waltz between truth and fiction, fiction definitely leads. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't talk about my private life. I was recently hospitalised uh, for exhaustion. That is a disgusting question. How could you ask me that? You people make me sick. <sighs> no, no, Rachel and I are just good friends. Look, I'm comfortable with nudity, you know, as long as it's not gratuitous. Despite all the offers, you want to choose the roles that best represent your brand. That means an endless stretch of soulless action films with shit scripts and lots of crap effects, whose biggest demand on you is that you turn up. Action Shannon and cue back right. Because really, fame is all about personal fulfilment. Except you'll have to give 10% of that personal fulfilment to your agent, 10 to your manager, and half to the government. And 30% of 20 million is practically poverty. Leaving the question, is fame really worth it? Welcome back to the show. We're chatting at Shannon Marinko and Lee Zachariah, the writer, director, producer, stars of this year's latest action blockbuster, Political Thought and History. Catchy title. It's a callback. You two play a pair of infamous rogue cops who play by your own rules and then break the rules that you started playing by. We actually have two versions of the clip to show you. This is how it originally played for test audiences. Well, there's your problem. What do you see? Three wires, a timer, and enough C4 to give everyone in a 30-mile radius a free haircut. Colours. Give me colours. Vermilion, Celadon, and Orlant. So which one? Do I have to think of everything? Look out! Now that's what I call great reception. The Arland. It's the Arland. Why? Just do it. Here goes nothing. <laughs> we did it. We saved the city. If only we could save our personal relationships. Anonymity is our reward. That is fantastic. Oh, amazing. No, it's boring. What? Why? We looked back at other action films, romantic comedies, all the big success stories, and discovered one thing in common. Fame is the answer. It's not enough to save the city from imminent destruction. It doesn't mean anything unless you do it live on air so other people see it. So, what did you do to alter the scene? Let's watch. Let's. And enough C4 to give everyone in a 30 mile radius a free haircut. Colours. Give me colours. This is Anne Woodward Bernstein of Channel 3 News reporting live from the city rooftop where two cops are attempting to defuse a bomb. I don't care how many crimes they solve. I want them brought in and arrested. Chief, what? I think you better see this. Hey, darling. What does your boyfriend look like again? And as we celebrate this most joyous Yom Kippur, we remember the people of... We did it! We saved the city! Hey, look! TV cameras! Johnson. Yes, sir. Reinstate those magnificent bastards. And double pay. I will marry him after all. I guess I do have a son after all. Merry Christmas, everyone! See? Well, that certainly is a lot more exciting. And I like how all your personal problems got magically solved because you diffused a bomb on TV. That's called good writing. It's interesting, though, isn't it, this obsession we have with fame and recognition, as if broad validation is the only real measure of success. Could it stem from our inherent cultural belief in a sentient creator? We, we feel life is inevitable because if the universe existed without it, who would there be to observe? 
No, we're just in it for the money. Lots and lots of money. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Me too. Phew. <laughs> oh, we'll be right back. <laughs> Say, Shannon, have you ever wondered what movie posters will be like in the future? <sighs> Sorry, I wasn't listening. Where are we? What do you mean? This happens to us every week. Wow, the future. Gasp, a robot. I am MK Ultra. I know, we've met five times already. Why am I the only one who remembers this? You may ask me anything you desire about the future. Good. What up? Except if it's about movie posters. Oh. Well, then, what are famous people like in the future? Future fame is similar to the movies of the past, which is your present. In the film The Fifth Element, one of the most famous people in the galaxy is a loud, irritating radio DJ played by Chris Tucker. Stop melting, ladies, because the boy is hotter than hot. He's hot, hot, hot. He has paid a lot of money to speak in a high-pitched, fast manner. No change there. Well, that film also had that blue opera singer. She was pretty famous. That was pure science fiction. You must learn to separate fantasy from reality. So there's nothing futuristic or sciencey about becoming famous in the future. Incorrect! Take the Terminator film series. John Connor is very famous in the future. However, he achieves that fame because people travel back in time and talk about how famous he will one day be. It is known as the Grand Famous Paradox. That joke always kills temporal physicists. Sometimes before they're even born. People only becoming famous because they tell us they're already famous? Not much has changed then. Oh, I'm sorry my tales of futuristic extravagance are so boring to you. Uh, no, 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 I, th I didn't mean it like that. Robots have feelings too, you know. Oh, of course they do. Can you send us back to our time now? Why do you think I can do that? Just because I'm a robot? Well, that's racist. You have to stay here. Oh, yes. No, no. We have to get home. Can you imagine what will happen if we don't return? You know, we here at the Bazura Project pride ourselves not only on our humility and lovemaking skills, but also on our ability to make good learning. Think of us as your cinematic North Star, guiding you on your journey of movie-tastic enlightenment. And fame is a regular port of call for many filmmakers. Now there's the celebrated fame films. A star is born to die for mommy, dearest. Postcards from the edge, the Rosemead, John Doe. Sunset Boulevard and being John Malkovich. Network singing in the rain. Whatever happened to Baby Jane? Quiz show all about evening of comedy. And the sweet smell of success. The smell of success. The bad and the beautiful, 42nd Street. Natural born killers. Simone and there's the Truman Show. Francis, Don't forget Chicago. Darling, They're all the films about fame. But what about the neglected films? The tired, the poor, the huddled masses of movies sailing towards terra obscura on the good ship SS Amnesia. Pilgrims, let me show you the promised land with these four forgotten fame movies. <laughs> Delirious. He's not the delirious you're thinking of. Hey, boy, you look mighty cute in them jeans. This delirious is from 2006, written and directed by Tom DeCillo. And it's a refreshing, surprising film about fame, because unlike me, no one gets off easy. It's about a paparazzi photographer who takes a homeless wannabe actor under his metaphorical wing, only to lose him to the forever alluring world of celebrity. I'm Toby. <laughs> Toby, all right. Yeah, he's, uh, he's my hookup tonight. <laughs> <laughs> it reeks of late 90s Sundance, but it's still worth more of your time than Happy Texas. What the fuck? We're working on a musical together. Oh, wow, what, what, what musical? It's about the life of Britney Spears. 
Imagine streetcar with karma in a Brando roll. Brando. On ice. It's a good thing Billy Wilder never made films in the 1990s. The collective cynicism might have destroyed the very fabric of time and space. Wilder almost did it single-handedly anyway with his 1951 film, Ace in the Hole. Kirk Douglas is a washed-up reporter working for a small-town newspaper who stumbles on a story of a man trapped down a mine. Douglas quickly conspires to keep the man trapped for as long as possible to milk the headlines, the money, the fame, and a ticket out of this hick town and hopefully back to the big leagues. Suppose we set up a drill on top of the mountain and go straight down. Do you know how long that would take? You tell me. This is not just a glass is half empty film. This is a glass is half empty, but there's acid in the glass and it's melting my fucking hand off film. And it's very, very, very good. We're all on the same boat. I'm in the boat, you're in the water. Now let's see you swim. If you ever wanted hard proof that there is no God, here is your holy grail. Because there exists a film that actually makes Sidney Lumet's network look dated and derivative. So if you value your blissful ignorance, maybe you'll want to look away for the next minute and continue to be a fervent denier of the Ilya Kazan-directed, Bud Schulberg-written A Face in the Crowd. A charismatic hobo played by Andy Griffith is plucked from obscurity to sing some songs and tell some funny stories on a local radio station. He soon becomes the smash it of the airwaves, then a TV smash, before finally hitting federal politics, turning this down-home good old boy into a power-hungry egomaniac. You just put yourself in my hands. I'll have them loving him. Now, this is a bafflingly forgotten film. It's embarrassingly good 20 years before Network, and if nothing else, it'll change the way you look at Sheriff Andy Taylor forever. This whole country just like my flock of sheep. Sheep. They're mine. I own them. They think like I do. <laughs> Only they're even more stupid than I am, so I gotta think for them. And lastly, a film that's like a trauma version of The King of Comedy, but nothing like that. 1991's The Dark Backward stars Judd Nelson, a garbage man who finds massive success as a stand-up comic once he starts cashing in on the third arm growing out of his back. I don't know why you did it. You think I could figure out what goes on in your head? You think you bring up a kid right, what does he do? He pulls a stud like this. Now, this film is just really seedy. It's grimy, it's ugly, it's aggressively different, and it's really not good at all. But it's movies like this that give all wannabe filmmakers hope that someday they'll get to make a self-indulgent piece of shit too. Look, Marty, it's all over between the two of us. I can't love a man with three hands. I'm sorry. I guess fame really is in the eye of the beholder or something. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time at the popcorn. the Bazuru Project Awards, where the famous mingle with the other famous. Graphic artists are working around the clock to airbrush celebrity blemishes live, stars are signing autographs to themselves, and unconvincingly humble platitudes are being fed to a ravenous press. A veritable collection of celebrities is making its way to the auditorium as Shannon Marenko and Lee Zachariah present the quintessential fame in film award. With all the attention given to film technicians and behind-the-scenes workers, one group is often unfairly overlooked. Famous people. And what better way to recognise fame than by giving it an award? And the nominees are... For Best Non-Celebrity Celebrity Appearance, Marshall McLuhan in Annie Hall. Oh, do you? Yeah. Well, that's funny, because I happen to have Mr McLuhan right here. So, so yeah, just let me... Let me, let me... Come over here, a second. Oh, Tell I, heard, I heard what you were saying. You, you know nothing of my work. You mean my whole fallacy is wrong. How you ever got to teach a course in anything is totally amazing. 
Boy, if life were only like this. For most desperate, repeated grabs at on-screen fame that add nothing to the film, M. Night Shyamalan. I'm not anything, you know. I don't think I'm anything special. So I started thinking, how is this going to happen? Why are people going to suddenly take me seriously? For the most bizarre, unprompted movie star cameo in history, Glenn Close as a bearded pirate in Hook. You bet against me bringing Pan back here, didn't you? No. Ah, tell your captain the truth. And for most watched movie of all time, with two billion estimated viewers, and we bet you're probably not one of them, the unrealistically plotted Jesus. This same Jesus Christ is alive today. He wants to come into your life, forgive your sins, and give you the power to live an abundant life. And the winner is... Us. Us. Finally! We won! won. <laughs> we won! <laughs> Suck it, actual nominees! <laughs> whoa, 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 we're losing the crowd. Quick, be gracious, start crying. I promised myself I wouldn't cry. Forget it, run! Oh, I'd like to thank God for giving me talent and humility. And that's the complete another history of fame in the cinema, the most deadly sin of all. Uh, actually, I don't, I don't think fame is actually a sin. It's a bit late to be bringing this up now. No, no, no. You know, there's uh, wrath, gluttony, sloth. You know, for a show about sin in cinema, maybe we should have brought some of this up. Uh, pride, that's another one. This is literally the worst time to bring this up. Just tell them what you've learned. I've learned this is literally the worst time to bring this up. And I've learned that fame is a hollow, soulless pursuit where happiness is replaced with sex, money and adoration from strangers. I love it so much. And I've learned that I'm going to quit this meaningless red carpet job and become a photojournalist in Burkina Faso. Isn't that, like, industry code for pregnant? No, that's up the Yancey. What's Burkina Faso? I think it's cocaine addiction. That's one. So until next time, Starlet, sign off, catchphrase. <laughs>